coming. Um, I know it's a Sunday afternoon slot and everyone is tired, but um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, so, welcome to uh, So You Want to Study Anime. Um, so, before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I am filming this panel. Um, I'll be posting it on YouTube um, after the convention. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end, so please hold any questions until then. Um, but obviously because of the filming, if you don't want to be included in the video, don't ask me stuff. <laughs> you can ask me stuff later. <laughs> so anyway, um, just as a... a Okay, so quick show of hands. Firstly, has anyone here been to one of my panels before and therefore knows what I'm about? Pretty much everyone. Good. Okay. Um, uh, next show of hands. Who here is actually in a position where they are possibly looking at studying something related to anime at higher education level? Contributing. Contributing? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. Basically, none of you. You're, you're here to hear me talk about how shit I am. Nothing. <laughs> Don't nod. I saw you. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, what this panel is and what it is not. Um, it is a hopefully humorous look at the surprises and pitfalls of undertaking a higher level research project in an unconventional field. Um, a source of insight and advice for anyone who may be interested in doing something similar. And catharsis for me, I guess, because I've been working on, I've been working on this project for a very long time and only recently finally completely finished it. Um, yeah. It's not, it is not an exhaustive guide to the MPhil or PhD process. Um, I will be very open and say that I went about this in a quite unconventional way. I, I gather that there are standard ways that you're supposed to do this, and I kind of didn't do that. But, um, uh, so I can only really talk about my own experience, and also that sort of thing is the kind of information you should be getting from a university anyway. Uh, it's not, also not universal advice. Every situation is different, every institution is different. Um, some places are going to operate in different ways to others. Um, and it's also not general information about university processes. Your graduate school should fill you in on that. So who am I? You've all been to my panels before, you know. Um, I am a long-standing anime fan and cosplayer. I've attended UK Anime Con since 1997. And as of Thursday, a newly awarded MPhil. <laughs> and I am also a massive fucking idiot. <laughs> I'm going to pose in front of this in case anyone wants to make it a meme. <laughs> I knew you would let me down, Andrew. I'm just going to put the word not in front of it. <laughs> but it has other applications. So, um, just quickly, some, spe some very specific things that I should not have done in the course of my working on this. I should not have got diagnosed with a mental illness six years into it. I also should have not got diagnosed as neurodivergent after I'd finished the thesis. Um, both of these things are very unhelpful to learn late in the process. Um, basically, if you're undertaking a project like this, it's a really good idea to know if there is anything... If you have any suspicions about yourself, it's a really good idea to get them looked into because struggling against these things when they're not being confirmed is incredibly difficult. Uh, I also moved house a week after my Viva. That was a good plan. <laughs> I've got a move. Um, I worked in a job where my manager was an exclusive of your choice. Uh, and also, I put the wrong date on my cover page. Oh. This photo was taken on 6th of January 2020 after I'd submitted it. No. Spot the issue. No. I, I didn't spot it until um, after I had gone to get the thing printed up and bound. And fortunately, the, uh, the place where I went to get it printed and bound had the capability to change the date on it, so they were able to fix the 2019, but only after they had printed the first lot. So I was like, it's okay, I'm getting one printed for my own use, so I have the, the one wrong one, and the correct ones were submitted to my university. But I took that photograph and posted it on Facebook, thinking, maybe no one will notice. Oh. E everyone will notice. How many did you have to print um, So, at the time it was uh, three copies. Okay. Three copies to go to the university, so one was for um, the... Uh, one was for my internal examiner, one was for my external examiner, and one was for the person who would basically be the chair. Um, but I'll get onto that a bit later. Oh, and then I had an extra copy printed for me, for my own use afterwards. So, getting started. Alright, before you get started on a project like this, there is one very important question you need to ask, and it is... Why? Um, and I'm not being entirely facetious there. Um, there are various reasons for undertaking a project this big, and you really do need to make sure that yours is one of the right ones. My reason for starting a PhD was I hated my job and I wanted an excuse to leave. 
<laughs> that was a silly idea. I mean, I still hated the job and should have left it anyway, but like, yeah, no. Um, saying, yeah, this is a great way, I was not. No, I was wrong. Um, PhD or an MPhil requires a significant commitment in terms of your time, your energy, your money, and you really do have to ask yourself if you're ready for that. And if your immediate answer is, yeah, of course, no, you're wrong, think about it some more. Um, you also do need to think about what you're going to do once it's over. Because it is, like I say, it's a significant investment of um, time and money. Um, and you can't just do it for a laugh. Um, I, I, I do know that sometimes there are people who get to the end of their um, programs and just go, uh, yeah, no, I don't want to do anything with this anymore, and that's fine, but you can't really sort of go into it and think, yeah, and no, I'll just do this for a bit. Choosing a research topic and being prepared to throw it away. Um, so the key thing about studying at MPhil or PhD level is that it's supposed to contribute to new knowledge, um, as opposed to a taught master's program or a bachelor's where basically you are taking the material and having to do some analysis on it, but essentially you're kind of regurgitating a lot of the same conclusions. Um, with a something like this, a research project, which is self-directed largely, um, you should be finding new things, coming up with new conclusions and adding to what is already established within academia. It's much better to choose a very large subject and narrow it down than it is to start with something that's too small, because as large as the thesis is uh, for a PhD, it's between 80 and 100,000 words for an MPhil, it's about half that. Um, as big as that sounds, if you pick a subject topic that's too small, you will struggle to fill that. And it's much, much better to start with something that's too big. Um, is the subject something that you can maintain an interest in for the duration of the project? Very important. Um, and also, it's very possible that you'll change your subject completely before you even begin writing. So knowing how to let go is very important. My initial pitch for my PhD um, when I started was actually about um, expressions of uh, Japanese national identity in anime. And it morphed fairly quickly, actually, into looking at um, anime fans in the UK um, through a process which I can basically even describe as, I read a bunch of stuff and went, mm, no, this is more interesting. So working on the project. Um, so a little bit of fun. Which of these texts did I not refer to in my thesis? There are two. <laughs> Oh, this could be a trick question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I, there, are, there are two that I did not refer to. All the rest I did. Oh, each time you would have pointed. Yeah. Yeah, each time you would have. Uh, also, wait, when did you do it? Oh, you didn't get any Russia. I think that's what you did. No, I, I, I started working on it in 2009. Oh, okay. So, possible that you did it as well. Film history and tabletop. Uh, so, just for a little bit of extra context, Table Talk Saki is a review of a Japanese restaurant, which was published in the Times. Oh, okay. If that helps at all. I think it does, because I know you did like a huge range of stuff, so mm. you're gonna just have to bloody tell us. Yeah, yeah so, so the two that I did not refer to here are uh, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword by R. Benedict, which is a fairly notorious um, uh, book written by a Westerner about Japanese culture. Um, I did not refer to that at all, and I also did not refer to anime and philosophy. Um, so there's two things that seem like they should be obvious things to refer to, and a whole bunch of stuff which doesn't seem terribly intuitive. Um, but yeah, including Pete Chan's Live Journal. So yeah, you, you, you need to read as widely as possible. Uh, you won't use every text you read, but that doesn't mean it was pointless to read them. Uh, reading widely will help you identify gaps in the existing knowledge, and also actually help you fill in places where maybe your knowledge isn't so great. Um, it'll also help you make connections that are not immediately obvious, but still extremely interesting. Um, I've got a friend who uh, works as a translator, and something he has said is that um, sometimes when you're translating something from no another language into your native language, um, sometimes you realise that just a really, really good way of translating something that completely encapsulates everything that's trying to be said in the original language. And whenever that happens, he hears the Final Fantasy VII victory theme go off in his head. And it's very much like that. So I, I had that experience. I was sort of reading and I was going, hey, wait a minute, no, this, aha, this is a thing I can look at. Um, so if you start with a large topic, as you should, uh, this will also help you narrow it down to a workable size. Um, and, very importantly, it also gives you something to talk to your fellow academics about, not just other students who are at your level, but also your peers, uh, people that you'll be seeing at conferences, people who you may need to contact about things that they've written and pieces of research that they've contributed to. Good versus bad sources. Uh, what makes a source good or bad depends entirely on how you intend to use it. Um, the most relevant source in the world can be bad if its argument is misunderstood or misrepresented. 
Uh, Non-academic sources can be good as a representation of viewpoints and discourses held at a specific time or as a contemporary news source. Think about my use of P. Chan's Life Journal, <laughs> which was actually about, um, in 2010 I think it was, um, the Telegraph sent a journalist to IACOM um, to write a report on it. I, I see Freya shaking her fist. Um, the piece that they wrote was, that I, it, it was very clear to anyone who read it that the journalist had gone in with the specific idea of, I'm going to write about what the lunatics these people are. And the piece was very uh, unflattering and um, actually quite mean-spirited in a lot of ways. And um, <laughs> I, I said afterwards, yeah, it's kind of what we could expect. But at the same time, it was just like unnecessarily mean. Um, and um, P. Chan had posted about it on his live journal, and there were some quotes from people responding to it, uh, including Freya. Um, and um, it was useful for a snapshot of what people were saying at the time. Um, the much maligned Wikipedia, it can be good, but it should be a starting point rather than a source in and of itself. Um, I saw someone, one time, who in their references put down the front page of Wikipedia as a source. That's like putting library as a source. Yeah! <laughs> the one that about Wikipedia. No! Because that could have been okay. But it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> I saw it in the references and I went, why? I'm writing a book <laughs> in the title. Source, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, social media posts. Um, these are increasingly acceptable as sources these days. Um, there are actually now citation guides available for tweets, YouTube videos, Tumblr posts, all that kind of thing. Um, like I say, it is entirely how you use them. Uh, the key thing is to take an analytical approach regardless of how reputable the source is or how reputable you think it is. Who's got time to read? Um, you should allow plenty of time for reading to make sure you fully understand the core arguments of each text, but as sometimes happens, and it happened to me, sometimes you find yourself up against the clock and you need to get through a lot of text in a relatively short amount of time. Um, the fact that I discovered that I have ADHD actually explained an awful lot because I was just like, oh, that's why I can't concentrate on reading these things. Um, but at times like this, AI these days is actually really helpful. Um, there are online summarization tools like GenEye or Scholarcy. Um, what you do with those is you kind of um, upload a PDF or um, Word document or piece of text to them and the AI kind of goes through the text and identifies, or thinks it identifies, the key themes. Um, and it will then present you with a summary. Um, this makes it a little bit easier to firstly understand what it's talking about very quickly, um, but also uh, to find the bits that are most relevant to you. However, it is not foolproof. Um, I did have some things I put through uh, Scholarcy and read the summary and went, this makes even less sense than the actual paper. <laughs> um, but also, audio tools. WordTune Read is one that I used. Um, Again, uh, it will read the text to you and you can adjust the speed so you can get through it much more quickly. So you, again, upload a PDF to it. It, it has a, a Google um, extension, Chrome extension. Um, you upload a PDF, set it going. Um, it, will, it has a range of voices. Um, you pick your voice, pick your speed you want, and it will just read through the whole thing for you. Um, and I find it really helpful to have someone narrate it to me while I was looking at the text. And because you can set the speed, you don't kind of feel that your brain is go going at the wrong pace relative to the voice, um, and I find that that was an actual lifesaver. <laughs> Trust no one, not even yourself. Your thesis may well be the most aggressively researched and cited piece of work you'll ever do. Um, when I was learning to drive, my dad said to me, no one drives as well as they do on the day they pass the driving test. Mm -hmm. um, and it is much the same thing with writing the thesis. After, after you've got that lovely qualification, it, st it stands for something, and you may not necessarily have to cite every little thing. But when you are working on this, you absolutely do. But as much as you need to avoid getting bogged down in details, it's also really important to not uncritically accept truisms and common knowledge. And it's so easy to do these days because um, so much stuff gets presented to us you know, through social media in um, infographic form and, um, and through memes. And there's things that are designed to be consumed very quickly and it's really, really easy to look at those uncritically and go, ah, oh, yes, that's, that's good and useful information, fantastic. Um, so even seemingly reliable sources can be wrong. Uh, and no one is immune to bias, including you. Um, also, if you are, as I was, writing about stuff that relies on your own memories, they can be deeply flawed, built on misconceptions, uh, and you forget things. Um, I, was, uh, I was at a conference one time, and Helen McCarthy was doing a keynote at it, and one of the things she said was, even like you, you, you can look at your diaries that were written at the time, and they'd be completely incomprehensible 
because it speaks to where you were at a time, and you've no idea where that was anymore. <laughs> um, but as a case study in checking your sources, so this is a, um, a <coughs> news panel that I've shown in a lot of um, presentations that I've done. It's, uh, I've, I was very pleased to find it, and it's, it's a great panel. <laughs> Snuff Out These Sick Cartoons was a very infamous um, article that was published in the Daily Star, um, and you can see it's sort of, you know, oh, the, the horrors of, of manga mania and the old sex and violence and oh, corrupting our kids, that kind of thing. Um, this was really important in my research and it was very widely cited in an awful lot of the papers that I saw and a lot of the book chapters that I've read. Um, but I wanted to read the whole thing. Um, so I, with my British Library membership, went down and started going through their um, microfilms um, because they have everything. Um, I looked up the date that was printed in every single one of the papers and chapters that I find this cited in and couldn't find it. And it wasn't, after, it wasn't until after an awful lot of digging around and looking up other things that I found out that every single citation had the wrong date on it. And my theory is that the first person to cite it was considered uh, reliable enough that everyone subsequently went, well, they wouldn't get it wrong, <laughs> and just copied it without checking. So Check your sources. <laughs> were you able to find it? Well, there it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a copy of somebody who got it wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so that's, yeah, that's the article I found it. Right. But people have been quoting from the article in book chapters and in papers and so on without having this. Right. Um, and um, but they were sort of saying oh, it was published in I think they, they, they were putting the date down as 1994 and it was actually published in 1993. Um, it, it was the, the date was right, the year was wrong, um, and uh, yeah. So I was just really pleased to find that. And the, this is why I show it everywhere, just to show firstly it exists. Secondly, I'm saying before you were still looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we got you back. <laughs> I, I even actually contacted the Daily Star themselves because you know to see if they had it in their archives, and they insisted that they had no idea what I was talking about. Oh, of course. <laughs> I was like, I can give you the name of the journalist. <laughs> anyway, so for planning your research, um, your reading is going to have to include some papers about research methodology, which, in my opinion, is the most boring part of the entire project because my, again, this is sort of the thing that I did that should not have done. I knew what I wanted to find out and I knew how I wanted to find it out and I went, go for it. Really should have actually done some reading about research methodology, especially because in fan studies, which is my field of specialism, it's such a new field of studies that they are still trying to establish what the best methodology to use is. Um, so unfortunately, doing some reading about methodology is completely inescapable. Um, and so you may have an instinct for what you want to research and how best to go about it, but you still need to be able to justify your choices and show that you understand the strengths and weaknesses of your approach. Uh, in my Viva, my external examiner said, so why did you decide to use this approach? And I literally just had to go, it seemed like the best option. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's especially important in newer fields like fan studies and also then to an extent things like anime studies um, which are very new and research methodologies are still being discussed and settled on. Ethics, very important. Um, if you are doing this, well you should be doing this through an institution, um, they will have an ethical framework that you'll need to follow uh, which will include specialist training. Um, if you're conducting surveys or interviews, which is rather nastily termed life subject research, <laughs> uh, you'll need to abide by various eth ethical considerations for the well-being of your interviewees, um, which will include things like having an explicit statement that they have the right to withdraw at any time, uh, about how their information will be anonymised in the final piece. Um, when I did my questionnaire, um, I, I think I did actually say to people the way it's going to be anonymised will be um, gender of correspondent, age group of correspondent, you know, and no other identifying information. Um, you'll also need to take data protection into account, which will include GDPR considerations. Uh, and you'll need to have a secure way of storing data from any questionnaires. Uh, ethics guidelines can and do change rapidly, so make sure you stay up to date. Um, the GDPR regulations came in while I was in the middle of things. Um, fortunately, they came in after the point at which my questionnaire had closed, so I didn't have to like go do everything again, which would have been awful, um, but uh, but yes, uh, things do can and do change very quickly, especially in something that is a new field of study. There's also nothing wrong with being overly cautious. Um, one of the things that came up in um, my in writing my thesis, and it's not necessarily an ethics issue, but it is still something that is worth considering from an ethics standpoint, is um, in writing about 
the way that British newspapers responded to things related to Japan in the 90s. It was very common for them to use a slur, an anti-Japanese slur, which I did not feel comfortable with including unredacted, but I couldn't really get around not printing it. So the, the, basically what I decided was, well, I will do what they do on the internet, which is to write it, but put an asterisk in the middle of it. So you can still identify the word, but it is no longer being used uncritically, and just included a, an extra note. Um, I spoke to several people about what, you know, what the best approach would be to this before I settled on that. Um, my supervisor said, just say it. Um, several other academics I spoke to said, there aren't any guidelines, just say it, it's fine. And I was just instantly... Well, white, right? <laughs> <laughs> Academia has a whiteness problem, which I will get to no. later. But, um, but yeah, uh, I, I literally sat there and thought, but there is so much discussion going on in academic circles about making it accessible and welcoming to particularly people of colour. Um, and it just felt like it would be wrong to me for me to just say, well, there are no ethical guidelines against using this word unredacted. So I thought, it's not going to hurt anyone if I am cautious. So I did, and it was fine. Writing your thesis. Are there any people here who are writers, either as hobbyists or just in general? So here's, here's, here's the handy advice I'm sure you all know. Set aside a dedicated period of time to write every day. Turn off your internal editor. Have a peaceful place to write. Get some pot plants or something. Um, yeah, sensible advice. It's good, right? <laughs> Safe to say I could not and did not do any of those things. I kill pot plants, it's great. Actually write a new thesis. You need to find the rhythm that works best for you. Uh, things will come up that get in the way. It's frustrating as hell, but it is perfectly normal. Um, really one of the best things you can do is to build a support network. Uh, family, friends, fellow students, your study supervisor, and reach out to them for support when you need it. And that, when I say support, I, do, I don't just mean talking to another student about, you know, oh, I've run into a problem with this particular thing, or talking to your supervisor about, I'm, you know, I have this idea about this thing, but I'm not sure about things I should be reading about it. Sometimes it is things like, can you cook dinner tonight? Because I really need to focus down on this. Make your workspace comfortable, whatever that means for you. It doesn't necessarily mean surrounding yourself with pot plants and having no distractions, because sometimes, ADHD brain goes, no, oh, but I want there to be some things. Um, as best you can, keep your workspace separate from your personal space. This is not entirely practical for the way a lot of people live. Um, I, but after the pandemic hit and I was working from home, um, by nature I just I could not avoid having my workspace in my bedroom because that was the only place where my computer could go. Um, it is not ideal because psychologically you lose the distinction between the workspace and the private space. Um, but as best you can, have some kind of distinction. One of the things that I've heard is to do things like, um, at the end of the day, put a blanket or something over your computer so that psychologically you've just closed it off. Um, whatever works for you. Some days are naturally going to be more productive than others, and just remember that all progress is good progress. It's the same with anything that is long and hard. Um, if you do something today, it's more than what you had yesterday. So some specific things that worked for me. Having multiple playlists to help with focus. Sometimes a playlist that worked on one day would be useless the next day. This is, again, literally an ADHD brain thing. I would sort of sit there and I go, well, ADHD brain, I need to focus on some stuff. So what will it be? Will it be a game or soundtrack? Will it be this lovely playlist that I've specially curated on SoundCloud? Will it be some classical music? Uh, my brain would go, I want the Silent Hill soundtrack. <laughs> I'd be like, OK, atonal clanging it shall be. But it was fine, put some stuff on. Um, working when my motivation levels were high and resting when they were low. I always think of how when uh, parents have a, a new baby, people give them the advice of sleep when the baby sleeps, and it's much the same thing. Um, sometimes it would be very late at night, and I'd need, you know, and I'd be like, I should go to bed, but I have all this productivity, and I, I really want to work on this right now. I'm gonna have to just go for it. Sometimes it's all you can do. Breaking the overall project down into smaller, more manageable sub-projects with bulleted lists of topics and attainable word counts for each. The good thing about this is you will cover lots of little mini-topics within a large project like this. Um, once you break those down, uh, set out basically what your chapters are going to look like, and then figure out what beats you want to hit. That actually makes it an awful lot easier. Uh, a project progress tracker, and it doesn't have to be um, like a complicated thing. Something I did actually was to set up a, a, an Excel spreadsheet where I could put in what my current word count was 
and it would tell me how many words I had left to go. And that was great, just watch the numbers go down. Uh, maintaining a cloud-based draft for quick edits, Google Docs was an absolute godsend. Um, I kept a copy of my thesis uh, on Google Docs, and then while I was commuting on, you know, in the morning, I had a sort of half hour, 45 minute uh, bus ride into work in the morning, um, I'd just be sitting on there, tapping away, adding extra notes. Um, submitting and presenting research papers at conferences is a great way of, um, firstly, it comp compartmentalizes your research, it means that you are producing something which you can then use later, um, and also, as I'll talk about later, uh, it gets you feedback very quickly. Uh, writing a trash draft and having a rubber duck, which are a couple of mystery phrases. But, so, the trash draft. I'm really annoyed that no one told me about this until very late in the day, and it was another student who wasn't even going to my university who told me about this. Um, it's a great technique if you're having trouble shutting off your internal editor, which I always, always do. I'm too much of a perfectionist. Uh, the trash draft is not about being good, it's about figuring out what you want to say and hammering it into shape once it's done. Um, the language doesn't need to be formal, the arguments don't have to be cited, they just need to be out. And it can be quite fun if you really throw yourself into it. Um, I started doing it when I was um, uh, working on the section of my thesis which was about the very first engagements between um, British merchants and Japan. And it was just so easy to just write the whole thing just talking about what a bunch of idiots they all were. <laughs> Come back and cite why they were idiots later. The important thing is you know what the narrative is at that point. As for the rubber duck, um, this is a technique for working through an argument you're having trouble conceptualising. Um, are there any computer programmers or... Is this a real thing? Do you actually have something that you talk to? That's a, I, I, I've always loved that ever since I heard about it. Um, so it comes from computer programmers keeping a rubber duck on their desks so they can talk about it with problems with their code. And the idea is that um, when you try to explain the problem to a third party, even if it's completely unresponsive, you naturally think your way through and work your way through uh, the problem to find a solution. So you could have a literal rubber duck or other toy, or you could have a cooperative friend. My cooperative friend was named Jenna. Uh, some of you may know her. Um, but who can listen to the, uh, you describe the pro problem and maybe ask questions to help you figure the problem out. And again, it's, sometimes it would, be, it would be, okay, so I've got this part of the argument and I need to connect it to this part of the argument, but I can't quite figure out how it needs to get here. So, but this is kind of my thinking and ah, there we go, I figured out how to join it up. And like I say, they don't need to necessarily know what you're talking about or offer any particular insights. The whole point is to just be there to talk it through. As a, as a um, SQL code, I do that a lot. I just sit there and go, how do I get my end point? It's, it's a great technique. I'll just, I'll just talk <laughs> and freak out people next to me. Are you talking? No. <laughs> if it works, it works. Citations. Uh, there are several different referencing, referencing systems that you can use. Uh, check with your institution to see if they have a preferred format. Uh, some examples that are popular in humanities fields are MLA, Chicago and Harvard. Um, Harvard is the one that I uh, used through the entirety of my bachelor's and my uh, master, my first master's. Um, my university didn't say, that they didn't specify any particular um, format that they wanted us to use, but it was more sort of, pick one that's appropriate. And I said to my supervisor, can I use Harvard? And he went, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Um, MLA is a really popular one, a lot of um, institutions use that, and uh, Chicago is one that I've seen specified for uh, things that are being solicited for publication in books. Uh, if you aren't sure how to cite something unconventional, such as a tweet or a YouTube video, like I say, there are several guides online for this now. Um, you can actually find um, you know, the, uh, the main institutions. They, they release new uh, books about their referencing system uh, fairly regularly, um, and as things move with the times, you need to have ways of citing these things. So there are guides available and you can find them very easily online. Uh, online citation assistants are also available. Um, if you have uh, institutional access to cite them right, um, it makes compiling your, bio your bibliography really easy. Um, you still have to like, physically enter everything, but at the end of it, it compiles everything in the right order, um, puts all the, um, all the details in the right order for each listing, and then you can just export it to a Word file. Very easy. Um, some other options include EndNote, which is an online reference management tool, uh, Zotero, a free referencing tool that also has a Chrome extension, and Word's own inbuilt citation manager, um, which again, you can tell it which particular uh, format you are using and it will just generate everything for you. Um, regardless of what method you use, you should construct your bibliography as you go, don't leave it to the end. This is a massive project. Uh, if you try to go through it and remember what all your citations mean, especially if you have multiple things written by the same author, 
you are going to just tie yourself in knots. It is so much easier to construct it as you go. Networking. Networking is a really important aspect of working on something like this because it can be such an isolating experience. Um, networking with other academics can be your fellow students who will be going through the same things you are, can offer help or advice, uh, even if they're not working in your field of study. Um, these can also be established academics and professors who can let you know about useful opportunities, give you alternative pers uh, perspectives. Um, an easy way to network is to attend conferences, symposia and social events. Um, very often I find that there are uh, events which are not in and of themselves academic, but which are of academic interest and which are free to attend. Um, the Daiwa Foundation in London runs a lot of events like this, um, and they're really interesting to go to. And because of the pandemic, a lot of them run online now as well, so it's not even an issue of having to travel to these things so much anymore. Um, but attending events like these um, are a way of letting you hear about your peers' work, uh, think about how it could complement your own, um, take some learnings from them, uh, but also give you an idea of how conference presentations should look so you can start submitting your own work. Submitting papers to conferences or journals is a good way to compartmentalise your work, as I've said. Uh, it makes the overall project feel much more manageable. Uh, a 10 minute presentation is much less work than an 80,000 word thesis. Uh, it can be slotted into your final piece later. Uh, the added bonus is that you get feedback from your peers immediately, either through the Q&A session or during break periods. Um, it's not at all uncommon at conferences for people to come up and say, hey, have you thought about this aspect related to your work? Or indeed, you can approach someone else who's doing something related to yours and get their perspective on something which, you know, is, you know something that you thought of while you were listening to them. Some conferences also have many events that are even less intensive than paper presentations. Uh, Fan Studies Network, um, at their conferences, um, they have a thing called Speed Geeking. Um, which is like speed dating, but instead uh, you are a, an academic with maybe some early research and um, you want some feedback on it very quickly and you just go around the tables, uh, there'll be a group of you, uh, you go around the tables and you um, tell everyone else that's at the tables about what you're working on and you get their perspectives. And it's a really quick and easy way of kind of, um, uh, I've forgotten what the word is, but um, workshopping some early work. And it's really handy. It's also a lot of fun. Um, the, the last time I went to one, um, someone came over and he was working on some stuff about cosplay. And I was there with Jenna and we just went, oh, let us tell you about cosplay. <laughs> community connections. The anime community is in general very friendly and willing to help others. Um, this includes long-standing members of the community who have produced written work, academic or otherwise, about anime. Uh, this does include me, but also people like Helen uh, and uh, Jonathan Clements. Um, several of us are really easily accessible through social media and are also very willing to talk about our research. The key thing is, though, to be polite and respectful in asking for help, and definitely don't expect your contact to do your work for you. Helen runs into this an awful lot. Um, people who contact her and are just like, I'm writing a paper about Studio Ghibli, tell me things. And it's like, no. <laughs> I I mean, Studio Ghibli is her field of specialism, but um, at the same time, you, you don't sort of go to someone and say, hey, i got to do this thing, can you do all the work for me? Like, no, it's just, it's, it's just rude. Um, submission. Make sure you're familiar with your institution's submission guidelines. These will include everything from your typeface and spacing to the format required for your printed copies, if that's still required. Since the pandemic, a lot of universities, I think, have moved entirely to just sending a digital copy. Uh, once you have submitted, either give yourself a reward or get someone else to give you said reward. Cake is good. That is cake. That is the cake that Desmond got for me. <laughs> I, um, about uh, six months or so before I actually finished and submitted, um, I was talking to my supervisor and my secondary supervisor, and um, you know, mentioned about the, sort of the last six months of working on it, and both of them kind of got the, you know, the war flashback face. Um, and uh, my supervisor said, it does kind of have a feeling of like you are killing something. Um, and so on the, on the way back, I texted Desmond and I said, um, hey, I've thought of something that you can get me for when I finish. I would like to have a cake that has on a cake topper of me killing a dragon made of paper with a naginata. And the madman went and did it. <laughs> you were very specific. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get me a dragon, but I'll take the massive stack of papers. <laughs> you. And, and I, I was just so pleased with that. Good. And it was a delicious yeah. cake as well. Hey. Even better. Awesome. This feeling never goes away, though. <laughs> as, as an example, I, I literally was pacing in my hotel room before I came down here, thinking this. Uh, I got that right after my talk as well. <laughs> yeah, 
The feeling never goes away. Finishing and finishing again. You're done, hooray! But it's not over yet. So, writing the thesis is the biggest part of the whole project, but it's by no means the last. Uh, the next stage after you submit is the viva voce, or viva voce, uh, which is a verbal defence of your work. Two senior academics, one of whom will be from your institution and one from an external institution, will read your thesis and then question you on your methods, conclusions and choices made over the course of the project. Um, it sounds scarier than it actually is. Uh, for one thing, one of the benefits is that you can choose your external examiner. Um, and uh, that means that you basically can look at all the academics who are working within your field, pick the one who you think is best qualified to um, assess your work. And that's actually quite exciting. Uh, so, how to prepare for your viva is to reread your thesis and make notes of any flaws you notice or details you forgot. Um, that's why I had my fourth copy that I printed out with the wrong date on the cover. Um, enlist some beta readers who will run a practice viva with you, and it doesn't matter if they're not academics themselves. Um, I had four beta readers, um, three of whom were actual anime fans, uh, and one was my mum, who knows absolutely nothing about anime, doesn't understand anime fandom, but it was useful because I figured if I can. If it makes sense to her, and if she can ask me questions and I can explain them in a way that makes sense to her, then I think I've done a good job. Uh, make notes of the questions your beta readers ask you and prepare, to, uh, prepare answers to any difficult queries in case they come up in the Viva. Um, some of my beta readers went hard. Um, I, uh, I literally had to cut the sessions short with one of my beta readers because she had this long, long list of questions and I was answering them, I was answering them very well actually and I was feeling really pleased with myself and then Desmond stuck his head around the door and said, hey, it's dinner time. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, for the most part, the questions that were asked by my beta readers did not come up in my Viva, but it was nonetheless nice to know that these were things that possibly were weaknesses in, uh, in, the, in, in the thesis that could come up and therefore give me time to think about what responses could be. Um, speak to your study supervisor about any particular concerns or worries you may have. Um, they'll also have some ideas about questions that the examiners will ask. Um, you can also actually have your study supervisor present during the Viva. They're not allowed to take an active role in it, but they can be there basically for moral support. The night before your Viva, get a good night's sleep as best you can. Uh, during the Viva, have some water on hand, which is always just good advice. And have a plan for what you'll do once the Viva is over. There's a lot of build up to this. And it's, you, you'll get to the end of it, and it's a sudden deflation. And it's the same as like anything that you, any big thing that you have spent a long time preparing for and planning for and building up to, and especially for something that you feel anxious about. Once it's done, you kind of have to sort of go, huh, huh. Um, a lot of the advice is things like have friends with you, have someone nearby that um, you know that you can sort of sit with and talk to. Um, maybe you know, go out somewhere, um, which obviously is pre-pandemic advice. <laughs> but the, the important thing is to have something so that when you are decompressing, you can do so, and you're not just sort of sitting there going, ah, what, what do I do now? Uh, during the vibe itself, don't panic. Try not to think of it as an exam. It's an hour or longer in which you have the unique opportunity to talk exclusively about your research with two senior academics. This is where it gets actually quite exciting having the external examiner who you nominate, um, because they know all this stuff already. And they're really important, at least in terms of your field of research. And they're talking to you about your stuff. It's great. Um, it's absolutely fine to take some time to consider your answer. Uh, it's better to answer slowly but correctly. Um, and it is perfectly normal during a Viva to have someone ask you a question that you maybe didn't expect and to just say, can I just take a minute to think about that? They're not going to judge you for it. Uh, it's also a good idea to have a printed copy of your thesis on hand so you can find specific sections if one of your examiners mentions it. So, you're not going to be able to recall immediately offhand what you said on page 97 of a 450-page thesis, um, but um, having it there means that you can go, hang on a minute, ah, there we go. Again, this is expected, it is normal, no one's going to judge you for it. So, the Viva is over, but it's still not over yet. So at the end of your Viva, your examiners will take some time to deliberate and then they'll give you their verdict. Um, possible outcomes are, pass with no corrections, which is rare. Pass with minor corrections, which is the most common outcome. Pass with major corrections, downgrade, downgrade to MPhil, um, or fail outright, which is exceptionally rare. The vast majority of people who sit in their Viva pass it. Um, it's just a matter of what they have to do afterwards. Uh, even if you pass with no corrections, there's still a little work to do. It's 
administrative stuff. Um, but for the majority of people who passed with minor corrections. The corrections phase. Minor corrections usually means spelling or grammatical corrections, clarifications of small details, um, little sort of extra bits that they maybe want you to kind of say just to strengthen your points a little bit. Uh, major corrections usually mean significant rewrites, may also include extensive additional reading and collecting more data. Uh, your institution will allow you extra time to make these corrections. How much time depends on the number and type of corrections required. Uh, once your corrections are made and have been submitted, your internal examiner will confirm the corrections have been made satisfactorily and then you get told you, you, can, have your, you can have your award. Um, I got to the end of my viva and they said pass with minor corrections and I was like, ah. Oh. And then I saw the corrections and I went, mm, some of these don't seem very minor. <laughs> um, so, uh, basically, the, uh, your two examiners will decide between them what corrections they want you to make. They will send you a document with a big list of them. And um, what I found handy for managing corrections was to create an Excel file with four columns. One for correction locations, one for the corrections themselves, one that simply says done and one for notes. Um, I copied all of my requests of corrections into the Excel file, wrong correction per row, also sectioned off you know, by section. Um, as you completed correction, put yes into the done column, very satisfying. Um, if you've added significant amounts of text, add this in the notes column with page numbers. This will help your internal examiner immensely and speed the process up. After I submitted my corrected version, they told me it would be six to eight weeks. It took about two. Um, and the reason why I think a big part of it is because I had very clearly listed exactly what amendments I had made on this Excel file which I sent to them. Uh, because Excel can be a bit difficult, colour code that shit. Again, really satisfying. Oh, that, that, that rose in amber. Oh, but I've done it now. Ah, it's green. I enjoy all the resulting dopamine. Um, not going to say though that the corrections phase is entirely easy and the best way I can express this is through the power of a TikTok which I made. sent a marked up copy of the thesis where she had made a bunch of notes on it, um, which was fantastic, very helpful, and I sort of worked my way through them in much the same way. Unfortunately, she didn't really make it clear which of the notes she had made were corrections I needed to make, and which were just things that might be of interest for me to look up. Oh God. Oh God. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> it reached a point where I was just like, do you know what, it's good enough. And as it was, it was. No, don't do that again. <laughs> Is it over yet? Essentially, yes, at this point. Uh, you still need to submit some small pieces of paperwork, a hardbound copy of your thesis, and at your discretion, a digital copy that your institution can make available for other researchers. And then treat yourself to something nice, like an anime convention. Yay! Yay! Or some more cake. Yay! More cake is always good. Oh, bye. Oh, bye. Uh, long term planning. Um, so, like I say, you may never want to look at this research ever again, and that's entirely valid. Um, however, you may run into things in the course of the project that you want to expand upon or new long-term projects you want to manage. One of the things that is very common is for you to sort of be reading and go, oh, that's interesting, but it's not related to what you're currently doing. And you really do have to set that one aside. It might be a good paper, it might be a good thesis, it's not this one. Um, you can seek an academic position with a university or other institution, or you can remain an independent scholar. Both have benefits and weaknesses. Uh, being attached to an institution means that you retain full access to library services and online resources. Uh, it'll be easier to get your work published and you may be supported in attending conferences to present your work. However, you'll also have teaching and administrative work to do on top of this and there's a sense of publish or die. If you're an independent scholar, you can do whatever research you like at a pace that works for you. However, you'll need some kind of employment to keep a roof over your head. Uh, you'll need to pay your own way to attend conferences and it can be more difficult to have your work accepted as an independent scholar. Now, fortunately, in a lot of the newer fields, there is a lot of sympathy towards the idea of independent scholarship. And actually, the number of um, uh, salaried academics that I've spoken to and said that I'm more comfortable doing the independent scholar thing because I have a job that pays well enough that I don't need to worry about where my, money, you know, where my food is coming from, what's keeping the lights on, um, then still gives me the freedom to, sort of, you know, in my free time, do the research that I want to do. And kind of all of them are going, yeah, that sounds really nice. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, a, a lot of the sort of more traditional places don't like independent scholars. They like to have people who are attached to institutions, I guess, as a kind of verification. Um, but increasingly, there are places that are open to. Uh, oh well, first of all, um, so 
here are my, my projects that I have. Uh, so the big one is a full archive of UK anime fandom history with both physical and digital access available. I am working on this at the moment. I collected a lot of stuff over the course of my, um, my research. I don't think that should be lost. Um, Carlo Bernardi does have an excellent uh, UK anime fandom um, uh, archive which he maintains online. Unfortunately, and I don't think he'll mind me saying this because he's been very open about it, he is terminally ill with cancer. And um, I really hate the idea of things like this, this history being lost. Um, I have already built an online timeline of events in UK anime fandom history. Um, I would like to rework my unfilled thesis for popular consumption because um, I think I, I get the impression from people that they would quite like to read it, even if they are not themselves academics. Um, and um, I, it, it's something that I would like to do. Uh, the cost of academic books is prohibitive, but if I can make it available for popular consumption, then it'll be much cheaper and therefore more, access more accessible. Um, other paper ideas. So uh, one of the things that um, I was going to work on and then the project fell through was uh, a paper about the connections between UK anime fan culture and UK punk rock culture, um, because I thought you'd be interested in that. Um, there are some interesting parallels. Um, but also, uh, anime fan parents and their decisions to introduce their children to anime. Um, one of the things that came up was I like, had said, you know, in, a, in an offhand thing, I'd said in my thesis about um, parents now who had grown up watching Pokemon on TV and now with their children are introducing them to Pokemon and other anime titles that way. And my external examiner said, do you have a citation for this? And I went, I'm sure I can find a citation for it. No, I could not. No one has actually done anything about um, parents who um, introduce their children to uh, Pokemon, specifically, um, having grown up on it themselves. Um, there's actually stuff about parents and children bonding with Pokemon Go, and that's as close as I can get. Mm -hmm. So there's a gap there, I'm going to fill that gap. Um, also peer review. Peer review is actually quite a lot of fun. I, I'm always a little bit terrified because I feel like I'm being a little bit mean, but like it's a good way of kind of staying current. Um, you can see what other people are working on, you can offer your, your experience and knowledge, um, and it's quite satisfying. Uh, places to publish or present. The Journal of Anime and Manga Studies. Um, this is an open access uh, online journal. Um, it's based at the University of Illinois, but they accept uh, submissions from everywhere. And you don't have to be a uh, higher level uh, academic to submit to it. Um, I, the peer review that I did was um, from someone who I got the impression was just starting at university, relatively young. Um, so yeah, they, they accept from everyone. Participations journal is uh, much more scholarly, but the, they are very open to uh, independent scholars. Uh, the Fan Studies Network conference is always happy to have people. Um, it's a great place to go and hear about um, research in Fan Studies. Um, the Transformative <coughs> Works and Cultures journal is sort of linked to the Fan Studies Network, um, and again, it's a sort of it's open to um, uh, independent scholars as well as people who are uh, attached to institutions. Also, anime conventions. Some conventions, such as Anime Expo in America, have a dedicated academic program. Uh, one day I'll submit something to them. <laughs> um, but also submitting an event to anime conventions like this is very easy, it seems pretty easy to get accepted. Um, and uh, anime fans I find are actually very responsive to finding out about their own history. And actually as well, based on a lot of the panels that have run this weekend, um, a lot of them do have a much more kind of scholarly and informative slant to them. Um, so just the fact that it's an anime convention where we sort of come to like hang out and get drunk and be silly, uh, doesn't mean that something that's a little bit more serious is not going to be welcome. Uh, some final words. Uh, so I know that there are no academics here, but <laughs> please don't be put off. Uh, despite my complaints, I'm genuinely glad I actually did this. I have no regrets about doing it. Uh, the journey has been generally, genuinely fascinating. Uh, the feeling of accomplishment at the end is amazing. Uh, I would also really love to see more anime and fandom academics emerge and run their own events like this. So if you're interested in doing this, then please do. Um, academic needs. Just because it's a new field of study doesn't mean it's an invalid field of study. Um, I, I just remember when I, when I announced my, um, my questionnaire uh, in the closing ceremony at Mananicon and, and Keith just went, why? Why are you looking at us? And I was like, because we're interesting. <laughs> and as it is, though, there's actually an awful lot of stuff there. So we can make jokes about it. Lord knows I do. But just because it's new doesn't mean it's wrong. Interdisciplinary research like this requires a great deal of flexibility and creative thought, which are valuable skills regardless of what you want to do next. Academia is still predominantly old, white, male and middle class, and that needs to be shaken up. And this is especially the case when it comes to race. Uh, even new fields like fan studies have a major problem with whiteness. Uh, it's severely overrepresented, um, which means that there are huge demographics whose experiences and perspectives are missing, or indeed bulldozed entirely. Um, there are certain uh, people who are working within fan studies who I follow on Twitter, and they are fantastic, wonderful, intelligent, insightful people. 
and they are constantly struggling against being talked over by people who feel that they're, especially, specifically when they talk about racism, who feel that they are making too much of it, or they're um, coming at it the wrong way, and they're, just, they're literally there like, this is my actual lived experience. Also, one day you could be the person who makes Adam Driver upset. What do I mean by that? Oh god, shit, let me come. I don't know if you made it, but you sent it to me. Yeah. No, I didn't make that one. Yeah. There was only one person I could talk about too. <laughs> And my response when, she, when, when Claire said this to me was to say, yes, it shall be me. <laughs> there is some general good advice. Drink plenty of water, watch your diet, don't eat too many snacks because your body needs a balanced nutrition to function properly. Um, and yeah, I, I have had times when I have been binging on chocolate and crisps and my brain has just gone, no, no more of this. Make time to go for a stupid walk for your stupid mental health. Duty music is optional. <laughs> <laughs> also, be kind to yourself. Uh, is includes allowing yourself some downtime. Um, I was I was talking to a friend recently and saying about how you know I had this long list of video games that I really wanted to play or continue playing, but I'm just you know so busy with getting all this stuff so I sort of like. And he just said to me, "Well, what's the worst that will happen if you take an hour or two to play a video game?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, you're right." So, thank you very much for coming. Um, If you like what I do, I have a Kofi, but no one ever sends me anything, but I'm not hurting for it, so it's fine. Also, my anime fandom timeline is available um, at that nice, handy, tiny URL. Um, it's, it's a constant work in progress, I'm con continually adding things to it, but it's there. Um, the time now is... We've got ten minutes. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Andrew. Um, you said that you might end up doing a PhD. Yes. What was it that stopped you going for it in the first place? Sorry? What was it that stopped you? Because you, you went for the Amphil. Yeah. Why didn't you just go for the PhD in the first place? Mental health. So I actually did go for the, I actually did go for the PhD in the first place. Um, but um, because of uh, mental health problems, a lot of sort of things that are coming up in my life, changing jobs and so on, and also being an undiagnosed ADHD and probably autistic, um, basically it reached a point where my university went, listen, we're not sure that you've actually done enough that you can, we, we're confident that you can complete this to PhD level in the time that you have available. And I was initially absolutely heartbroken um, because it sort of felt like the MPhil was the cons consolation prize, um, but uh, it was the right thing. Um, and. Um, and it does leave me op uh, the option of coming back to it later because the good thing about what I've done is that it's continually developing. And in my conclusion, I did list a whole bunch of things that would be worth investigating in the future. Uh, there is always the option of me going back to my questionnaire and running it again because things change. Um, you have new generations coming up. Um, there is always going to be something there and there is always going to be material there for me to build on later on. And I'm sure I could eventually produce another 40,000 words. We look forward to it. <laughs> Yes, Claire. So, um, the institution you did this with, yes. um, what kind of support were they offering in the way of like supporting you through this process? What kind of, did they offer any kind of like uh, extra support courses, like how to data validate or like that, to make use of those? Um, yes, yeah, so um, the graduate school is actually really good about um, communicating with, uh, with the graduates and graduate students about training courses that were available, um, opportunities. Um, one of the nice things about Bath Spa is that they occupy one of the wings of um, Corsham Court, which is just outside Bath. It is a stately home. Um, it is incredibly fancy. But it was, it was just so, it was very nice to actually go there because it's, it's a nice quiet place. You can just sort of sit and read. Um, if, if you're in the sort of, um, if you're in the graduate wing, they have usually tea, coffee and stuff. And so it's quite luxurious really, there's peacocks outside. Um, but, uh, but also a lot of the training sessions were run there. So it's sort of a nice kind of uh, environment where you go and participate in training sessions. Um, they were also really good about transferring to online sessions after the pandemic. Um, in terms of general like well-being support, um, they offered the facility to suspend your studies um, for up to two years, which I did take full advantage of, um, you know, in, in times when my mental health was really, really not working for me, um, and times when um, I was going through a lot of personal upheaval and I needed the extra time. So I say that I worked on this for 10 years, it was, in practical terms, more like about 
seven and a half because they were only mm. <laughs> because there were periods that I'd suspended. I mean, it still ended up that it was ten years with a weight around my neck, but um, but at the very least, the university was very accommodating. Um, obviously, some universities are not going to be so good for that. I probably did get quite fortunate, um, but um, I did find that um, my university was really supportive, both in terms of keeping abreast of your training needs and also keeping making sure that your wellness was okay. Something that was said to me very early on was like please, if there is something going wrong in your life, you need to tell us. And um, they, they told me this story about another student who had said that um, you know, she'd been having a lot of trouble with keeping on top of her study because her, her mother had cancer, and they were just like, suspend! For the love of God, suspend! Um, yeah, so it's worth looking into what your graduate school will offer before you start working on a project like this, but yes, I, I, I have no complaints about how supported I was by my institution. Yes, Laura. Hello. Um, when someone emails saying we're looking for short abstracts. What does that mean? So an abstract is like a pitch. Um, it's usually about 300-ish words. Uh, it'll, it'll tell you how much that is, but um, the idea of it is that you uh, submit a pitch for a thing that you could submit um, you know, for a book chapter or for a presentation. Um, it's, for an academic abstract, it will basically set out the um, structure of your argument, what you want to say. Um, it will provide some citations you know, to show where your research is coming from. Um, they may ask for keywords, um, which is usually for indexing purposes. So you sometimes see with um, academic uh, journal articles, um, there will be a list of keywords at the bottom, those have been submitted by the author um, for indexing purposes. Um, they may also ask for a bio, um, which is always a fun thing to write, but, um, but in essence the abstract is just a pitch. Um, and it's probably much the same as you know, if you want to um, if you want to get a book published, um, or if you want to um, you know if, if you're pitching a TV series idea, you know, similar things. Um, it is literally just I have this idea. This is how it's going to look. What do you think? Um, and like a proof of concept. It's like a proof of concept. Yeah. Um, it, it will be uh, your pitch will be accepted or um, rejected on based on the abstract, but. Um, that's not something to necessarily be afraid of, I don't think. The fact of the matter is everyone is going to submit one and some things are not going to get accepted for whatever it is. Uh, if you're submitting to a conference or to a, a journal, they, well, for conferences they will solicit um, abstracts. Um, they put out what they call a call for papers. Um, and uh, you put together your short abstract, send it to them, they accept or reject. Um, with, uh, with journals, again, it's usually, what, what would you like to submit for this? Here's the sort of stuff we're looking for. Make sure you hit the beats, send it to them. Um, so yeah, that, that's essentially what an abstract is. My lecturer described it once as, um, this is what it is, this is what it's for, this is how it works. Yeah. I think it means different things depending on what level you're at as well. True. We were taught in undergrad, it basically, like, it basically no abstract I've ever submitted has required weird indentation, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it's basically, um, like you say, um, this, is what, this is what I want to say, this is how the project is basically going to look, um, and um, you know, if, if you are going to be conducting some research for it, it will also just sort of you know, explain what your research is going to be, with the promise of there being results later on. We have time for one more question. Did you choose to go to Bath because of where you were at the time, or because there was a supervisor academic you wanted to make a take advantage job in the not room? Because I know a lot of the PhD students who come to our university come miles and miles because there's a particular academic that they want to be supervised by. So yes, at the time I was living in Bath, um, and I went to Bath. So those docks you were sorry. I don't live there anymore. Okay, right. Cool, <laughs> but, but no, so um, I I, uh, I had started looking at Bath Spa because yes, it was local, and also because um, I was thinking of doing part-time study, which at the time their fees were significantly lower than um, than their full-time fees. They have they have fixed it since they went. Wait a minute, we're the only university that does this, and they've they've made their um, part-time fees more expensive, uh, still cheaper than full-time, but you know, more expensive than they were before. Um, <laughs> I went along to one of their open days and um, you know, started hanging around the cultural studies stuff. Um, spoke to an academic who then said, "Oh, we have someone who specialises in animation. Um, you know, and his specialism was more British uh, animation. But he was also he had he had young children. He was also familiar with Studio Ghibli and he had some interest in anime as well. So um, so he was happy to take me on as a gra graduate student and act as my supervisor." Admittedly, on the understanding that he was going to have to do a little bit of extra reading to keep up with me. <laughs> um, 
Um, and then, as my project morphed from being about anime to being about anime fans, he actually was still quite happy to keep up with that, and it turned out still actually knew a fair bit about the, um, about the field and was able to still advise me, which was very fortunate. Um, the only change that I had was that my secondary supervisor changed partway through um, for reasons that I don't know, but the person that they found to replace my original secondary supervisor was also very well familiar with the field. Um, so yeah, they, they managed to pair me off very well. Again, I think I got lucky in that regard. I was about to say, it does sound like you were very lucky. Really. I was very lucky. Um, goodness knows what I would have done. <laughs> well, well, if they, if they couldn't have matched me up with someone, I would have done nothing probably. <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, no, it, it does seem, like I say, I went about this in a very non-standard way. Um, and it's, I suspect, much more the case that people apply to universities to do PhDs because there is a senior academic working in the field who they want to benefit from their experience. If no one else has any I've, final... I've got a thing, it's not a question, but it's... Is it more of a statement? Sorry, <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's not a statement, it's, it's, a, it's a suggestion of something for you to look into if you don't know its existence, because of something you said you might be interested in doing in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not Pokemon related, it's Final Fantasy XIV related. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of Dad of Light? No. So, there is a well-documented story about father in Japan, real real story, real life story, about how he used Final Fantasy XIV as a way to bond with his estranged son. Mm. Um, there's even a, I believe it's on Netflix, mm. there's yeah. a, um, like a yeah. dramatization yeah. of it as well. So it's, it's quite a well-known story because he's passed away now. Uh, was that partly, I'm just looking it up, is it partly because he knew he was dying Yes. The sad part isn't the point, but yeah, yeah it's, it's a, it, it, it might be of interest to you if it's if, if sort of like using. Uh, yeah, there are parallels, so yeah. Yeah. It's a, and, and not just Pokemon, like, like my, my parents aren't into anime and manga specifically, but my dad is a Silver Age comics collector, therefore I ended up going to comic shops with him. Where, you know, as a, as a young girl, I might not have done because they are essentially intimidating spaces. So having that sort of bridge and that sort of thing. And parallel with music as well, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah.